Welcome back to another episode of The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. I'm your host, Callaway. My guest today is a three-time founder who got his start making extreme sports videos. He parlayed that into an online ad network and media company that eventually sold to USA Today Sports in 2008. After realizing he didn't want to spend the rest of his career in online advertising, he left USA Today and started his first software company, Swarm. Swarm was a retail analytics solution for small and medium-sized retailers. The vision was to make a Google Analytics-type solution for brick and mortar, which would unlock tons of interesting opportunities, including things like automated marketing based on in-store behavior and foot traffic analytics. He sold that business to Groupon in 2014. During his time building Swarm, he was selling the product through a network of local IT providers. When he realized only a handful of those providers he was working with provided the expertise and service level he expected, he knew there was an opportunity for disruption. In 2016, Electric was born. At Electric, this founder and his team have a super simple mission, make IT really easy for companies that don't have a robust IT department. For small and medium-sized companies that don't have multi-million dollar budgets for IT, they still want a world-class solution that's gonna work with them rather than against them. Today, Electric has about 200 employees serving over 300 customers and is seeing incredible growth. This was an inspiring interview that got me fired up about the future of work and the way companies will continue to evolve with software. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Without further ado, the founder of Electric, Ryan Dennehy. Let's get it. Ryan, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Pumped to get into it. So before we dive into the origin story and, and your background, what I'd like to do is start with kind of an anchor point with where the company is today. So can you go into for Electric, kind of what are your mission, vision of the company and, and size, employees, um, revenue today? Yep. So the, the vision is pretty simple. Uh, you know, the idea is make IT really easy for companies who don't already have a huge IT department. You know, and so kind of the vision when I started was to take IT from kind of being this sort of forgotten about, sometimes, you know, inconsistent, expensive service offering and turn it into a, you know, pleasant, smart uh, SaaS offering and, and basically make world class IT accessible to small and mid-sized companies that don't have a multi-million dollar budget to spend on this stuff. And so, you know, right now we're close to or in and around 200 people worldwide. Um, we've got about 140 in, in New York City, uh, and then the rest split between Argentina, India, and uh, Rochester, New York. Yeah, I mean, your, your guys' growth has been crazy over the last few years, so I'm excited to get into it. So let's, let's kind of rewind the clock. Let's start at the beginning. Do you want to, in a nutshell, just walk us through kind of your life and background leading up to electrics. So I know you started some other companies and you have, you know, a unique background. So kind of take us through that journey. Yeah. Well, I was actually making extreme sports videos. That was, that was my first company. Um, you know, so when I was a teenager, just like shooting mostly mountain biking, uh, and, and, and some skiing, but you know, basically that, that led me to doing my first tech company. It was a online ad network and, and media company venture backed with my business partner, Rudd Davis. And that was, 2007, like late 06, 07, um, I was in college. Um, you know, we built that business, raised about a million dollars, got it to about a million dollars in revenue. That company was acquired by USA Today Sports in um, on New Year's Day, 2008. We are really lucky on that one because I think our investors at the time were saying, no, just stick it out, like raise more money later in 2008. Like you guys will be fine. You know, business is booming. And so, uh, you know, we were very that was glad. a good call. Very glad midway to, through 2008 that, yeah, we were owned by a, a large public company. Um, you know, so did that for four years. Um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I think, you know, our, our earnout was only two years, but we stayed, we stayed two years extra just because, you know, we, we were just having a lot of fun being able to kind of like reinvent a media business. And we were both really, really young. I mean, I was, you know, a year or two out of college, but was the vice president and GM of, of my group at USA Today. Rudd was running business development for all of, you know, USA Today. And so, it was good, but you know, by 2012, we just realized that online media 
specifically online advertising and, and publishing was not where we wanted to spend the rest of our careers. And so we uh, we were both living in LA at the time. We moved to to San Francisco and and started our first software company. The company was called Swarm, uh, and it was a retail analytics solution for for SMB retailers. Basically, our idea was, you know, could you make a a Google Analytics type of solution for a brick and mortar retail store? You know, basically tell a small business owner, you know, foot traffic, conversion rate, sales in in one place. You know, the vision there was, you know, long term. We, you know, if you do that correctly, you could automate the marketing for you know millions of SMBs, and, and we felt like that was a really interesting opportunity. Um, it was a hard, you know, really, really hard business. Like we, being media guys, just kind of assumed that you could just snap your fingers and build like a multi-million dollar revenue business. Like we had never sold software before, and so I think it was like kind of a, a rude awakening there of like. You know, convincing a small business owner to spend two thousand dollars with you a year is just as hard, if not harder, than convincing in the media business an ad agency to give you a hundred thousand dollars. Right? <laughs> you know, but we made changes and we learned faster than the, the amount of mistakes we were making. So we kind of like outran our own incompetence uh, and inexperience. But uh, you yeah, know, we got the business to you know millions of dollars in in, in revenue and. Um, and then we were kind of at this turning point or this sort of crossroads, like in 2014, do we raise more money, build something bigger? Um, you know, but then we ended up getting an acquisition offer from, from Groupon. And so, you know, we Groupon's vision at the time was, hey, if we have an analytics solution that has point of sale data, that has foot traffic data, that at the time we were also building a device, which was a huge mistake, but... Um, like a piece of hardware that would go in the small business. Yeah, it was, it was a Bluetooth beacon and, you know, that was probably the most simple approach you could take to building hardware. Like we didn't make the the passive infrared sensor. We didn't make the Bluetooth chip. We bought it from Texas Instruments. We assembled it in a factory and it was still a nightmare. But look, in the end, it was a really compelling technical asset for a company like Groupon. And there was a lot of strategic value and it was just it ended up being a great outcome for everybody. So, um, you know, we felt that like that was a far better home for that. And so again, that was also a lot of fun, but that was running that company was where I came up with the idea for electric in the first place, because we had the hardware component and because we integrated with point of sale systems, we actually sold our product through a network of local IT providers. And so it, it was a really good channel for us, but I think the, my biggest takeaway at the time was, I think we had about 150 partners. There were maybe a half a dozen that I thought were really good and that provided a really consistent kind of end customer experience, you know, and, and, and the rest, it was really anyone's guess. Like, how do they feel when they woke up that morning, right? It would kind of like dictate the quality of service our customers got. And so to me, I kind of looked at that and I thought, this is crazy. You know, there's 100,000 local IT consultants you know, just in America alone who are basically responsible for the last mile of, you know, service installation maintenance for thousands of software companies and, and, and technology companies and so to me it just seemed crazy that you have companies on one end are buying and using more software and technology than they ever have before there's more and more software and technology companies just in general more vendors but somehow for a smaller mid-sized company like the thing the connective tissue between the two is this sort of hodgepodge of largely unsophisticated local providers and so even before we sold Swarm to Groupon, I looked at that and I said, yeah, that's a huge business. Retail analytics stuff is cool, but like the real <laughs> business is if I can figure out how do I take this kludgy service industry that sits between software vendors and, uh, and end customers and deliver that as a piece of software, right? You know, and I think, and, and I had a lot of people, I, I talked to some of my investors at the time. They're like, well, yeah, it's like too hard, which I think is a ridiculous thing for an investor to say. <laughs> like, Obviously, that's why no one's done it, but that, like, that's not a good reason for me not to try to do it. Um, yeah, it's too hard. Like, I don't think you can automate this stuff. Like, it's, yeah, there's a reason no one's done it before. Um, but I looked at, like, we at Swarm, we were an early customer of Zenefits. And I remember looking at the Zenefits product and saying, like, all right, if you can, if you can take benefits and payroll, which is a very complicated thing to do, and basically make it so that, like, I got, we got all of Swarm up and running uh, on benefits and payroll in an afternoon using Zenefits. And this is like in 2012, a very early version of the product. I'm like, if I can do that with a, with a relatively simple piece of software, like I can definitely automate 
a big chunk of an IT department for a similarly sized company, you know? And so, uh, so then after, after, um, after the Groupon deal, you know, I spent a fair amount of time after that, just thinking about like, okay, I think, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity with this IT stuff. And, you know, I think armed with the experience of my first two companies about like what not to do, um, you know, just kind of set out to, to try to figure this out. Yeah. So what did that kind of first six to 12 months look like, like tactically? So you, you thought about it for a while. I'm sure you tried to poke holes in it a bunch of different ways. Did you go out and get, you know, partners from your previous companies to join in with you right away? Did you use like freelancers to build an MVP? Like what did that look like? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what worked really well, which was something I didn't, we didn't do in the first two companies. Yeah. Um, in the first two companies, I think we just like so badly just wanted to get something off the ground that it was like, let's just go build this thing and like not really think it through. And I think for a lot of people who who are cut from the right cloth to be founders, like you have a certain level of impatience and a certain degree of like being okay, throwing caution to the wind. But you have to balance that with also like it's a business and there's a science to it and there's a process. And so you kind of have to balance those two things together. And Electric was the first company where I didn't just dive in head first. I like actually thought about it. I'm like, okay, so like there's a lot of different segments of the market that I can sell to. Where should I start? Right. And so even before I ever even raised money, I thought through like, okay, the market is divided into these segments of large enterprise on one end and like really small SMB on the other end. Right. And and then there's everything in between. And so I I, I spent a lot of time thinking about like, well, is this a good product for a large company, you know, 10,000, 20,000 employees? And there are a lot of reasons why it wasn't. And I just kind of kept working my way down and, and until finally I landed on this, this segment of companies that are like 20 to 250 employees. Now we sell to a much, a, a much wider band, but, but what, right when we launched, I was like 20 to 250 is the perfect size because they're large enough where they have an IT budget, but they're too small to have a full IT department. And so therefore, their pain is the biggest. They have a real need, but they're, they're just not equipped to handle it. And, and companies of that size can actually pay for stuff, right? Versus like a five person company just can't pay you a lot of money. And whatever pain you're solving is, is probably just, it, it's still very small, right? Um, you have really limited surface area in a company that size. So, so before I ever started the company, it was like, I got a lot of that work out of the way. A lot of companies, a lot of pre-seed and seed stage companies spend a lot of time and money doing that part of the the research of like figuring out like who's going to who buy sell to right yeah. yeah and i think like with my first two companies like we did that we spent the first year in change on our investors dime basically wandering around in the desert figuring out what we were doing and i was just like i'm not going to do that because once the clock starts ticking it, it, it moves fast right so that's a long way of saying like the first six months of electric we had immediate product market fit but it's only because I had spent two years thinking about it while I was running Swarm and another year and a half thinking about it afterward to really hone in on like, who am I selling to? Why am I selling to that person? Why do they need it? What do they need, right? Like, for example, like we also, you know, we almost got killed in the first two years of, of, of my first two companies also trying to do too much. So the other thing is like, once I figured out who we were selling to, we also came up with like, who are we definitely not selling to? Right. And, and stay away from those people. Yeah. Cause it's like, it's really compelling to be like, Oh, I got it. Like this person wants to work with me and pay me a lot of money. Like our second month in business at electric, you know, the, it was someone really senior at, I think compass, um, you know, the real estate tech company reached out and was like, Hey, we could pay you like a lot of money if you could do these three things for us. Right. And there was like this decision point of like, that's like, it's a really big company. That's a ton. It's a ton of like, we would, we would hit our, you know, we'd be halfway to our first year goal just by signing them up and this and that. And we kind of anchored it back to like, yeah, but why are we here? Like it's to serve a company that's between this size and this size to do these things. Like we could go sign that deal, but it has nothing to do with the business we're running. It's like we would be helping them with it, but like, like that's not, you know, it's not the vision. So a lot of, a lot of the first six months of what we were doing at electric was just saying no. The other thing though, too, is I had also learned from my first two companies, like we spent way too much time in development of an MVP. Like it's really easy when you obsess with an idea to make your MVP way beyond the MVP stage. Next thing you know, you spent six or eight months developing a product that you've never, like, you're not really sure if it's exactly what customers want. 
So we did it the opposite way at electric. I was like, I'm, I'm going to build basically nothing in the beginning. Because my only job is to figure out what's the product and the solution that people want. I can build the proprietary technology later, but I just have to prove that like this is a thing and a method of delivery that people want and they're willing to pay for and all that. So you know, we built a basic Slack integration. We set up a Zendesk account. And then I hired this guy, Julian, uh, who still works for us. He was working at Geek Squad at the time, hired him. He was our first support technician. And so like we had a handful of customers. We were supporting a few hundred users. So Electric would show up in their Slack and they could Slack Electric with anything, any help they wanted with IT. The ticket would come in and then Julian would take it and resolve it and log it in Zendesk. And then at the end of the week, the customer would get a nice little PDF report. So for the customer, it looked like really neat software. It was like, cool, I like, I hit them up on Slack. I get a report at the end of the week. Like, this is amazing. This is like so much better than my local IT provider. You know, but for us, it was like, it, it, you know, tickets would come in. And we're like, oh my God, what do we do? Like, we got, yeah. <laughs> but it proved, it proved within, you know, 30 days across a handful of paying customers. Like customers loved it. We were getting a lot of really good data. We were charging people's credit cards for thousands of dollars a month, which like any two month old startup, that's pretty rare. Yeah, very um, validating. You know, and so, you know, and, and we signed those customers through cold calling. Like we didn't even, I later signed up a lot of my friends' companies because it's what you should do. <laughs> um, but like a bunch of our first customers were just people that we, you know, just cold emailed and demoed, right? So I think, and like, that was the biggest thing I think for us in the first six months was like, prove that this is a service that people really want that's better than the alternative that they're willing to pay real money for and prove that we can just go like acquire customers um, without any marketing. Yeah. So that early customer acquisition, like non-friends that were paying, was it just like a light bulb? As soon as you demoed, they're like, whoa, like this is, there's nothing like this is exactly what we need. Did it almost sell itself? So yes and no, right? Like even for companies that look like they are a rocket ship, that grow really fast, you, what you also have to understand is that even a company that has flawless product market fit, for every customer you sign up, there's a hundred that tell you no. And that's, that's like your best case scenario, right? I mean, even like last year, for example, we, you know, our sales team added 7 million in new revenue last year. We made 120,000 cold calls to sign a couple hundred customers, right? Like it's, it, the numbers are crazy, even when the product market fits really good, right? So in, in the early days, I mean, we were sending uh, Bill Tyndall, who ran um, revenue for us, uh, was the first employee. He was, he was sending thousands of cold emails a week, you know what I mean? To get like 10 demos. And to have, you know, eight people tell them that they didn't need it, <laughs> you know, so, so it's like you get to the end of the year, you know, the, and I think like a lot of the investors didn't necessarily like they don't, they're not in the kind of in the trenches with you. So like at the end of our first year, we had, we'd gone like zero to a million in ARR, no churn, uh, you know, a couple thousand users, like a pretty straight trajectory. And they're like, wow, this is like amazing. Like, let's like, let's go. But meanwhile, it's like I sit on, you know, at the time I was like, I'm sitting on, you know, 20 demos a week where people are like, eh, yeah, I don't need it. I don't really need this. <laughs> um, a question I have about the product. So the way you centralize it, is it just that there's so many tasks from organization to organization that are similar that you don't really need like company specific specificity for your, you know, the people on your team that are being those IT specialists or every time you onboard a company, are you training up? you know, a, a certain group of people on your side to like learn the company specific rules and protocols? So it's a mix of both, but the short version is when companies about five to seven years ago started adopting mostly cloud-based SaaS software, the shift that happened was that a lot of that software doesn't have a lot of custom configurations, particularly the software that's used company-wide uh, by everybody that gets used a lot. So take, for example, email like G Suite, you know, or Office 365 or whatever. My, the version of G Suite that I'm using and that you're using and that, you know, nearly all 350 of our customers are using is basically the same. There might be some nuance to like email forwarding rules and stuff like that. But for the most part, like it's all the same. Like the version of Dropbox that I get and that you get is the same. And so you know, I think like when VCs ask a question like, you know, why why now for a company? Like 
we couldn't have started this company 10 years ago when everybody was using legacy software that all had a custom deployment, right? Like 10, 15 years ago, every piece of software that you used had an implementation kind of like Salesforce, where it was like everything, including your email, had to be deployed in a custom manner, you know, on your own server. And there was like one guy who knew how it was all set up. Like you, you can't build a tech company around that and to automate that stuff, right? And, and so, you know, so what we've been able to do is basically say, look, you know, kind of going back to this whole idea of like being really clear about who we won't work with, like companies that knock on our door that have a lot of this bespoke software, not for us for right now, right? Because that doesn't, we can't serve them in a really scalable way. But for somebody who comes to us and says, hey, I've got 200 employees, I'm, I'm you know, one IT guy. And we use 50 different applications and the vast majority of them are, you know, pretty run of the mill SaaS apps. Um, yeah, we can totally help you with that. The integrations are all the same. You know, the way that I reset a password across most of those things is, is the same. And so what we've done is we've built a dashboard that lets the customer dictate how the workflows go. But the actual automation of the individual task is virtually the same across everybody. So when you think about product iteration, you know, you talked about early on, you had, you had Julian in a, in, a, in a back room with the Slack channel. Talk about how you grew from there to where you are now. Like, A, how did you think about what features and product enhancements to add? And B, what were those that customers were wanting in this space? Yeah. So our, our business was a little different in the sense that we took a huge gamble by coming out of the gate, selling the full solution, saying like, we're your outsourced IT department effectively, right? And we're going to do all these things. And we could do all of those things because it, I stood it up as a services business with a software front end, with the idea being, we're going to, we're going to A, learn how to sell the full solution, the full price solution, right? From day one. And then B, we're, because we're selling the full solution, we're going to capture 100% of the data that we need to figure out what needs to be automated and when, right? Whereas a lot of SaaS companies build a product, kind of lightweight product, they get it in market, they get a lot of people using it, and then they got to go back to the drawing board and say, what other features can I add so I can charge people more? We kind of did it the other way around. And so, so in some way, like operationally, it was a disproportionately more complex business to run. It would be so much easier if it was all just software, but at the same time, like, if it was all just software, we'd be charging one tenth what we would charge now because we'd be delivering one tenth of what we can do and and i would just kind of be taking the easy way out right like we'd be missing the bigger the bigger picture so we, we just had to stick to our guns and say like it's hard for a reason but that's why no one's doing it and if it were as easy as just standing up a you know a little widget in slack you know there'd be a hundred other people doing it but uh, there aren't right so we so we had to we just had to stay really steadfast in our conviction that like this is really hard, but it's supposed to be. And that's why there's going to be a big reward, you know? So, but the, the, the one part where it was easier was then we had all the data. And so I could look at my database at the end of a quarter or at the end of a month or end of the year, you know, so for example, at the end of 2017, I could see a hundred thousand support tickets that we resolved, right? I could say, well, what are the most common? What are the least common? What are the ones that cost us the most? to resolve manually? What are the ones that don't really cost us anything, right? And you know, what are the ones that have really low satisfaction or high, sat so you start to look at these different data points and say, okay, the ones that are really expensive or the ones that we're really bad at doing, like build software for those first. Right. Because then the customer is going to be happier because we'll screw it up less and we'll be happier because we'll actually spend less money, right? And then you just kind of, and then you just work your way down the list. Systematically go through. Yeah. Which is way easier said than done, but like that's kind of what we were able to get to. Yeah. So a question here around like the product feature fit. Early on, as you were as you were building and deploying, do you have any stories where either customers push back on something or like they were frustrated with the way something was deployed? I feel like when you have a new solution, it's so much better than the incumbent. Usually, a good proportion of the customers is like so grateful that you know they 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 roll with it. But did you have any any kind of frustrations as you were iterating? We had a ton. We had a, like a ton, and I, you know, and I'm not afraid to talk about it now, just because, you know, now we have a phenomenal team. The product is really kick ass, and you know, I just have a ton of confidence in what we're able to do. And our CSAT and our MPS now, you know, reflect that, right? But you know, 
in 2017, the company was small enough where it which was our first year. The company was small enough where like you could kind of fit all of the knowledge you needed about all 60 of our customers or 80 of our customers or whatever whatever it was in your own head. And so could our team. And you know, now today with 200 employees and a killer executive team and a great product, like, you know, that's sort of the systems do the thinking. But there was this whole middle section that was really messy where, you know, many of our customers had a great experience and some of them did not, right? And, you know, and that was because as a very, very young company that quickly had to become a more mature company, like things that work when you're, you know, doing a million dollars in revenue, even at two and a half or three, completely stop working, right? Um, and so, you know, for us, I think the biggest issue kind of in that like messy middle section was really around service delivery. You know, we were trying to build a, a technical product and evolve our our service, the actual like human service piece at the same time, right? And it's just, it was challenging to do because I think, if we if we actually if we hadn't had had immediate product market fit, we would have at least had time to take a step back and reevaluate. But when you basically just like six weeks after raising funding and already you've got paying customers who are like, this is great. And, and like the sales machine's already working. There's no time to like take a step back and reevaluate. It was just like, go, 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 you know. And I think with a with a really services heavy business like ours was in the early days, like if you don't have the right leadership team dialed in, if you don't have like, you know, OKRs dialed in and really understand like what each department is, you know, needs to needs to achieve in a given quarter, you know, numerically, uh, the things will start to blow up really quickly. Right. And so, you know, we kind of went through a patch where, you know, we never we, we always grew substantially and I never took my foot off the gas from a growth standpoint, only because I like we always knew. If, if we were struggling in a certain area, we always knew what we had to fix. Like there weren't, we didn't have underlying product market fit issues. We didn't have like more fundamental problems. So my view was always like, well, if you, if we keep, if we know what we have to fix and we fix those things and we keep growing every new customer that will come in, we'll be having a better experience than the one who came in before. You know, that's ultimately what, what wound up happening. But, um, you know, the, it was definitely, there are definitely some challenging periods there. And, and again, a lot of it just came back to like, dialing in the team and the goals and iterate, iterating on those fast enough so that it could keep pace with how the business was changing. Yeah. I want to, I want to quickly shift to, to marketing. So something that I'm, I personally find fascinating is the way different products and solutions craft marketing strategies and then, and then use that to scale. So for you guys, you had a lot of success early on product market fit, which is huge. And it sounds like your sales funnel was, was tightly tuned early. But what are some of the marketing tactics that you guys have deployed to either build awareness or, or then ultimately convert customers as you grow? So we took, we took kind of the opposite approach early on. Like most startups, what they'll do, particularly if they can kind of, if, you know, if they know that they've got good search volume for their, you know, for their product, is you know, typically you'll stand up you know, Google ads and Facebook ads and things like that and start closing inbound it. We did it the other way around we basically said, we know we have product market fit. We know it's good. We know we don't have any competitors. We know that it's priced correctly because there's any kind of a existing market rate for managed IT services. So knowing that and knowing how big the market is, you know, my goal was get to the first 3 million ish in revenue without any marketing. The only marketing we do is direct marketing. So outbound email, cold calling, that's it. And my thinking was, if we can do that, the hardest part is nailing the sales pitch and objection handling and like, how do you get the right person on the phone? And then how do you educate them on your solution? And then how do you sort of like, you know, run a proper discovery call and, and like move them through the pipeline in a way that's consistent and predictable? And like, how do you train a sales rep to do that once you've learned how to do it? How do you, how do you enable them to train someone to do it? All that stuff takes a really long time. And we, we, I kind of figured it would probably take us, you know, a year or two years to do that. And so my fear was IT services already had a lot of search volume that, you know, if we just stood up Google ads and just got a bunch of inbound leads, like we'd get to a couple million in revenue really quickly without ever really knowing how to sell the product to anyone other than like 
smoking hot inbound leads, right? And I'd seen a lot of companies when I was living in, in San Francisco who would get to their first couple million in ARR really fast because they would just, you know, through clever, you know, search marketing and, and, and things like that and, and, and close inbound. But then when they had to go two to 10 million, it was like, shit, I don't like, now we got to figure out how to actually sell it, right? And like, that's, and, and so my view is like, let's, let's, let's go backwards, right? Like, let, let's, if we figure out the hard thing first, then when we layer marketing on top of it, um, you know, we'll find that, that, that this whole thing scales a lot more predictably. And so that's ultimately what we did. I mean, I don't think I would take such an extreme approach doing it all again. I think also part of the reason why we did at zero marketing was I just, I don't know anything about marketing. I only knew how to, how to do, um, sales teams, but, uh, you know, in the end, like that, that definitely worked for us. The type of product we were selling lended itself really well to, um, you know, to a phone based, uh, you know, AE driven sale. So it was just, it was a lot of that. It was like a lot of brute force in the early days for sure. Yeah. So I want to talk quickly about competition. So for you guys, it's, it seems like you have a, you have a big moat and you were the first ones in the space to do anything like this. Do you have kind of emerging competitors that are doing something similar to you? And, and if not, how do you think about the competitive landscape? So there are, there are a lot of companies doing bits and pieces of what we do, but for large enterprises, right? So if you're a 5,000 person company or something like that, there are a lot of companies that will provide, you know, an automated, you know, basic automated IT stuff that can help make your existing IT department more efficient or there's companies that do like chat-based ticketing, things like that. In the segment that we sell into, which is, you know, the couple hundred thousand small and mid-sized offices in the US, we don't have any direct competition at the moment. You know, typically if we do kind of go head to head with anybody, it's often an established local or regional IT service provider who is providing some kind of turnkey, you know, solution to these companies. You know, and so for us, for the most part, what we're finding is that we can price our product a lot more competitively simply because we're a tech company, right? The local IT provider basically adds up the amount of human hours required to service that client, adds margin on top, and then that's what they sell it for. Our model is just completely different. So um, particularly at times like right now, you know, in, a, in kind of a down economy or an uncertain economy, there's a lot more urgency to find a, a more efficiently priced solution. And then, and then the second thing too, is a lot more IT buyers are digital natives, right? So more and more of these IT guys that we talk to um, are, you know, in their thirties, right. And want a more digitally native solution. We talked to, you know, plenty of folks who, who have, you know, been in, been in the industry for, you know, 30, 40 years who also get it. But, but what we're seeing is that there's just a much younger crop of IT decision makers who are also saying, Hey, like, yeah, why, why, why can't our provider have a chat integration? Why can't I have dashboards? And then we, we show up and we're like, we, you can. And that's, that's, that's only going to increase. So that's, that's a good observation, a good connect point now, right? Is you're only going to have more and more younger IT decision makers, or at least digitally first, digitally forward type of decision makers. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if you, if you've read any of the news uh, that's come out in the last, you know, few weeks or, you know, last month, uh, Microsoft Teams and Slack, you know, together probably have over 100, 150 million, you know, daily active users, right? If you looked at the numbers sort of like pre-COVID, it was, it was a lot lower than that. And so, yeah, I think that's, it, it's stuff like that where all of a sudden people became remote work and collaborate, you know, collaboration software experts uh, overnight. And so I think anyone, you know, when you think about what does IT look like going forward? Well, it's got to really properly incorporate a, you know, remote work, work from home kind of component, or at least be very friendly to that kind of thing. It's got to incorporate Slack or Microsoft Teams. And so I couldn't have predicted that, you know, that was just, we saw those trends happening. It's just, they've kind of gone like that, you know, in the last six weeks. Yeah. So I'm curious your response to the teeter totter of, you know, the, the upswing of what you just said, people are now remote work, digital first, then you're going to need this. And the offset of companies may not have as much spending or they have to reallocate budgets to spend on that. You know, where's that trade-off land right now and, and in the next 12 to 18 months? Yes, yeah, so I think the, the, the four trends 
that I've outlined that, that are going to impact us the best one chat adoption, like I just talked about, I mean, that's just, that's undeniable. And so if you can, if you can walk into a company and say, I've got a solution that lives inside the platform that your team members are already using every day, that's really compelling. Yeah. The remote work piece, which I talked about, right. Um, I think more and more remote employees means that there's an increased focus on it as the core business enabler versus say like the physical space, like an office. The third is IT transformation, like an old school IT model, for example, like a local IT guy showing up at your office is now, it's much more obvious why that's inadequate um, than it was before. Yeah, and then again, smart, smarter budgeting, right? So there's much higher urgency for companies to figure out how they can get the back office parts of their company to run for less money, but still run really well. But, you know, but then what does that mean in the short term? You know, I think for us, you know, what we found is that across the board, it's almost, it's all universally positive. You know, a April was funky because I think a lot of companies were just confused and either reforecasting for the year and therefore not sure what to spend money on because they didn't know what the budget was going to be. You know, I think for us right now, it really is just going to come down to uh, our sales team just being really smart about who they talk to and making sure that, you know, all the companies that we talk to understand why our solution can help them you know, whether it's because money's tight or their people are dispersed all over. A question I have for you around growth, for you guys to level, and I know you've had incredible growth, but for you to level up again, are you focusing on that, that 20 to 250 segment and just, you know, getting deeper penetration, deeper market capture in that segment? Or are you starting to look at some of the things you mentioned before, right? So maybe tiptoeing into these bigger, larger companies where the process might be different, the, the solution might be different. How are you thinking about that? Yeah. Well, so the, the answer is yes and no. The the segment that we sell into is so big as it is, we've only really just kind of started to scratch the surface. I mean, we got the 10 million in, in ARR in three years, and I think we'll add another 10 million in less than a year. But that was selling to a really, really narrow band of customers within within that 20 to 250 range, right? Like the first two years we were in business, we only sold to companies that were predominantly Mac users using Slack and G Suite, right? It's only been in the last year that we've also, that we support Windows, that we support Microsoft Teams, that we support Office 365. And even in that time, you know, we were still only just kind of warming up, right? So, you know, 90% of the market we could be selling to in the 20 to 250, we weren't really selling to until about a year ago. So, so one, we, we just want to continue to get better and get more coverage in that market because there's an insane amount of room to grow there. And we just, we want to stay focused. We want to be the best at that. The second is we are selling to slightly larger companies now than we used to, but we're not going to the enterprise, right? Like for us, we have a lot of customers now that are 300, 400, 600. We have one customer who's almost a thousand employees and they fit within our ideal customer profile because they're using all the platforms that we support. They are not interested in building out a huge IT department. Where we draw the line though, is if you're a 500 person company, but you have a big IT department and a bunch of custom applications, like that's not for us. That's not the type of customer we serve. Now, fortunately, if most 500 person companies aren't like that, um, but that's why just because a 5,000 person company comes in on our website and says, I really like what you're doing and I wanna pay you a bunch of money to work with me. It's like, well, more often than not, that winds up becoming a completely different solution. And so we're sort of, tiptoeing up in size where it makes sense for us. But, you know, particularly now with companies all over America thinking about cost cutting, you know, we had a, a Fortune 500 company, you know, right into one of our salespeople the other day. And we were like, that's just like, it's, it's flattering to get people asking that, but it's like everything you do to service a customer like that is completely different than the segment that we're in. And I think way, way too many companies, way too many SaaS companies at our scale, kind of the 10 to 20 million, wind up particularly those who sell into the segment we sell into close one or two big enterprise deals and then think well if we just close 10 more of these then we'll double revenue next year no problem the problem is there aren't 10 more of those that are exactly like the first two that you closed they're always they're always way harder there's always going to be a couple of outliers where you get that those those handful of deals that are way bigger but they just happen to work there just usually aren't very many more of them yeah you can't depend on those yeah, and then, and then what winds up happening is then you're like, all right, cool. So we'll do this much revenue from the segment we're already going after. Then we'll, we'll do you know, this much from enterprise and we're going to hire all these enterprise sales reps. And then a year later, you wake up and like enterprise did nothing. And then you got to let all those people go. And it's like, we're not even going to go there. 
Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I want to talk about funding. And I'd love for you to layer on, I mean, you've raised money three times, first time founder when you on your first company, and then and now raising for electric, you had two successful exits already. So I'm sure that changes the game a bit. Can you walk us through kind of your journey to fundraising and, and any lessons learned you would share to aspiring entrepreneurs in any of that any of the phases you were in? Yeah. Fortunately, electric has we've always been well capitalized and i've been able to raise money from really great investors on on very good terms and so you know with the caveat being like there has you know prior to two months ago like there has literally never been an easier time to raise money than you know call it like 2010 through beginning of 2020 but the combination of like it being the easiest time in the history of the world to raise money uh, in that you know time period with the fact that I also made every fundraising mistake possible in my first two companies. So like specifically with Swarm, the stuff that we screwed up a lot with the fundraising was the first one was that you, you got to make sure that you got sort of like the trains are leaving the station at the same time. So like we were raising our Series A for like a year because we would just keep taking intros and keep taking meetings on like a rolling basis. And so like you can't run a process if I start one conversation this week and I start another conversation in two weeks, I start another one in a month. You know what I mean? And so I think as a as an early stage founder, it's really easy to like get the intro to some well-known investor and take the meeting. But like why? Like are you are you are you intending to run a process right then and there, or are you just taking the meeting to get to know them? Both are fine, but what you know what we did that we really messed up was, you know, I think most of 2012 we just were just sort of taking meetings as they came, and, and there was no real plan, right? Um, so, so avoiding that will make a huge difference. The second one is, you know, just listen to people. Like a lot of people, you know, I think we just like didn't take a lot of advice we were given around like, like on the one hand people often like to say that like VCs pattern match and they're looking for sp a specific growth profile. And, and then you'll get some people who are like, well, that's like, don't listen to that. And every company is different. Look, the reality is VCs at the end of the day are just playing like a risk game. And they're basically saying like, are you good? Is the market big? And am I being presented with like a credible plan <laughs> to, you know, to get you from here to here? And like, if I give you a dollar, this ten dollars come out the other side? You know what I mean. And, and, and so, like when I look at some of our early fundraising decks for my first two companies, you know, it was like some big vision that like maybe made sense, right? And then there was like where we are now, and then nothing in between that like told a really buttoned up, credible story of like, hey, if you give me two million dollars, I'm gonna build X, Y, and Z and hire these three people. And the business is then going to look like this in 18 months. And even if we do a bad job, it'll still look like this. And therefore, you know, we should have no problem getting into a series A or series B or whatever. Never did any of that. It was just kind of like, here's the big vision. And, you know, and then it was like, oh, I can't believe no one will give us money. It was like, <laughs> I didn't give them an investable thesis. Those are, those are probably the two biggest things. Like if you can just sort of get, and, and the, the, the nice thing is now with like, you know, Twitter and other, you know, platforms like, Founders will give you advice. Like I get, you know, first time founders hit me up frequently and are like, hey, can you look at my slide? Like, sure. That's awesome. In that similar vein, can you think of a story or a specific lesson you learned from an investor pitch? Yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, most of the pitches that went poorly were, were like the game was lost before we ever walked in. Like full stop, right? Like, I mean, I can think of when we were raising our Series A for Swarm, like we... We rolled into a ton of meetings. Like we would somehow make it to a partner meeting. I don't know. Like, like, despite having a really wonky pitch, I'm gonna like, like, we'd somehow get invited. Like, like, make it to the partner meeting, and the pitch would just be this Frankenstein. Like, we would tailor the pitch to what we thought they wanted to hear, not with what we were actually building. Like, you know. And then I think in hindsight, we were we would get really defensive. Not defensive with an attitude, but just like. When you ask a founder a hundred questions about their business, the expectation is maybe they know the answer to like thirty of them, but you can at least talk through how you might answer them. And I think we just like sat there and tried to have an answer for everything. That's a huge red flag. Like uh, you know, we, we you know we also kind of like had this really old school mindset of like not taking no for an answer. Like the reality is, if VC tells you no, like that, that it's, there's no coming back from that. Like it's done. You know, so like I mean, at one point, I think we you know we we had a I think reasonably well known VC just 
tell us like just please stop contacting me you know because we tried to turn the pitch around yeah <laughs> if you were if you were to kind of manifest the future where electric sits five to ten years from now or five to seven years from now what do you think that looks like and where do you want the company to be uh big public company very well-run company very profitable company if we want to be uh, but yeah i mean i think like this is one of those things where i think when i when i think about all of the opportunities in the world i could be i could be chasing right now of like anything i'd want to be doing i mean i don't there's there's not another company i would want to be running or another market opportunity i'd want to be going after because it's uncapped like i can make that i firmly believe we can make this company as big as we want to make it and i think that in you know call it 10 years from now there's no reason why this can't be a very very well performing public company so you know the, the the goal between now and then is like execute well on a daily basis but always kind of stay anchored to the fact that like we think the sky's the limit and so whether it's strategy hiring fundraising always keep in mind the fact we're, we're trying to make this as big as we possibly can and we just need to be smart along the way yeah so we'll shift more to kind of like the rapid fire round it's one of the topics i alluded to earlier was hiring which you know I, i'm under this mentality that if Hiring is the most important thing. If if you get rock stars and you bring the right people around you and build a team, like that's that's the number one thing you can do to drive success. And and what I've come to learn from these conversations I've had with founders, a couple questions around this. So the first, what characteristics do you look for other than like you know specific technical characteristics for certain roles? What broad characteristics do you look for for people you hire? So the the the, the two biggest things are one is stage fit, and so. You just, you have like the person that you're hiring and this generally is for like management level roles on a manager, director, VP stage fit is everything. Uh, the, the second thing is proven ability to have done the thing you need them to do before. Right. And so, and they don't have to have both of those things. Right. But, you know, for example, if I'm, you know, if, if I'm hiring a manager of some department or if I'm hiring a VP or an executive or whatever, Often when you hear about people joining a startup and it not working, more often than not, actually stage fit is, is usually the issue. So you have an otherwise very talented person, but they've never had to do their role at a company your size before. And so, for example, like a VP of engineering at a 500 person company is a way different role than a VP of engineering at a 50 person company, right? A VP of engineering at a 50 person company is expected to not have a lot of support on HR and recruiting. So they've got to get on LinkedIn and they've got to hit up engineers on their own, right? Like a VP of engineering coming from a 500 person company wouldn't even think to do that necessarily, right? And, and the next thing you know, like they're missing their hiring goals and they're not actually shipping. So stage fit is one of those things where like, for me, it's almost a non-starter. You know, when we screen candidates, uh, you know, for manager level positions, like it, 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 they have to have excelled at a company of our size before. You know, and again, the second thing is like they had to have done the, the thing before that I'm hiring them to do, right? So like that's another thing, a trap I've seen founders fall into is they get enamored by, you know, particularly at the early stages, people who come in and are really excited about them and their mission and are like, all right, like, let's do this. And it's like, yeah, but that person, like you're hiring, you know, let's say you're a million dollar revenue company trying to go to 3 million or 5 million. And you're talking to a sales leader who's never led a company to triple digit growth. It's like, and they've never sold into your segment before. And like, what do you think's gonna happen? They're probably not gonna be able to do it, right? Like, and I've just seen way too many founders be like, yeah, no, but like they worked at like this really well-known company and like they're, they're smart, they'll figure it out. It's like, I don't know. Like history tells me they probably won't. And you'll be in the market for a new sales leader in eight months, right? And you know what I mean? And, and, and I think a lot, a, a lot of candidates actually like don't necessarily appreciate that either you know we we've often got had a lot of people come in really excited to come work for us and we're like yeah but this isn't this, it's not the size of company that you have experience in it's not the thing that you've done before right so i think just because somebody wants to work for you and has a great resume doesn't mean that they're the right fit for the job well on the flip side of that what advice would you give to like if it's a sales leader or a vp engineering vp finance that wants to break in the space and like you obviously need one of those opportunities to have the experience what would you say to them right just start small and try to grow into so you have that experience yeah i mean from the candidate side i think it's uh on the one hand it's tough on the other hand i'm not saying that like 
if you've never worked at a company smaller than 500 or 1,000 people, I'm not saying that you can't work at a 50-person company, but you're going to have to be able to do is prove that you understand and appreciate all the things that you're going to have to do at that 50-person company that you've probably never done before. Show that you're aware of it and show that you have a plan, right? Like, like one of the things that we do that's been, been super effective is for any role, director level and above, we basically figure out what are the, the, the two most important things that I'm going to have you do when you get here, you know, if we were to hire you. And at the end of the recruiting process, we give you those as kind of like a prompt and you have a week to work on something. And you got to come back and basically say, like, here's how I would do that thing, right? And that's kind of our way to stress test, like, all right, like the two the two things I would have you working on anyways if I hired you, like unlimited information, like show me how you would go do those things. Yeah, I love that. And, and, and if the presentation they come back with is something where I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I feel like I'm in a meeting with someone I've worked with for a long time. You're like, great, then they're hired. But half to two thirds that make it to that final round wash out at that stage. So, you know, so again, if you're if you're trying to go to an earlier stage company, even if they don't ask you for something like that, put something together. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's great advice. Um, one more, one more question on hiring. So I read in an article, you know, you you focused like a six month period or a twelve month period on really, really building out the the executive team that you needed to level up. Can you talk about that process a little bit and you know lessons learned, frustrations? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I think the biggest thing was like we, we were kind of going through this this inflection point of growth where. I knew I'm like, I can't, if I don't have a really, really excellent leader over every part of the business, like we're just not going to, like, we're not going to grow in the right, in the right ways. Like we're going to grow, but but like things are, things are going to break. So for example, we had a phenomenal head of sales, but we didn't really have any executive leadership over account management, you know, customer success and, and stuff like that. And so like, you know, like these things all have a force multiplier effect on one another. If you pair a great head of sales with a great head of, customer success, you're going to sell more and retain more. And then the customers you retain are going to create referrals for your sales. Team. Like it's all good. But if you have a weakness over customer success, sales, all of a sudden, next thing you know, like they're not getting referrals. Commissions are getting clawed back as people churn, you're signing. Weird. Like it's just, you know, and so I just kind of had this moment um, last summer where I was like, I've got to hire a bunch of executives, like, you know, between now and the end of the year, because if I don't, if I don't, like, I'm just, I'm going to be perpetually putting out fires and it's going to really impact the morale of the people that I do have. And so, you know, I had to come to terms with the fact that like, you know, recruiting is one of those things where you're either doing it or you're not like, you can't sort of like recruit some of the time. Like if you really want to make a go at hiring somebody great, like it's kind of got to take up most of your attention. Um, and so particularly if you're hiring in my case, it was for four roles, you know, once for executive, you know, head, head of engineering, head of product, chief customer officer, uh, head of marketing. Right. So I went, so I, I went back to, to the executive team that I had at the time. There were you know, three other folks. And I said, like, this is what I'm going to focus all my time on. Like some fires are going to burn and like, that's okay because we don't get these people on board. This is all a giant waste of time anyways. Um, you know, and I think that's like, that's really hard to do. It's like, I'm, I like kind of being in the details and I like making sure that things are, are humming along smoothly. It's not in my nature to like let things drop, but you know, at a certain point you just have to say like, all right, well, without these people, it's not going to work. So I, I have to be okay letting certain things not happen. I'm curious about your, your approach to mentorship. You seem like a, a kind of person who would have a lot of, a lot of mentors in different areas that you could kind of lean on. And in order to build several companies, I'm sure you need that. Can you talk about kind of your approach to getting mentors and, and, and building those relationships and then the best pieces of advice from mentors you've gotten? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing I learned a long time ago was that, you know, the answers to anything are all already out there. Like, like there's almost, there's almost nothing that you're going to try to do with your company that hasn't been done before, probably by lots of people. Right. And so you know, if I've done anything right, it's that I've always thought about what my problems are what my biggest, you know, kind of business problems are, whatever I'm trying to solve. And then just go solicit feedback from the smartest people that I know, right? And so, you know, for example, like even a couple months ago when we when we raised more money, you know, it was really important to me, you know, getting um, Dick Costello and Adam Bain on board was, was like super, super important to me. You know, we didn't actually need to take new money and my insiders were happy to fill the whole thing on their own. But like, 
you know, Adam Bain is one of the best revenue leaders in the history of technology. That seems like a phenomenal guy for me to have in my yeah. corner. You know, Dick is one of the, you just one of the best, best operators, um, you know, in tech. And so like, that was a really good example. Like for me, it was like, that drove my fundraising strategy. You know, I was like, I want these guys to be invested in this company, mostly because it's a strategic win for us to have access to, to them. Right. Um, and you know, now like, I email them all the time. Right. I mean, even like when all the, all the, all the, you know, COVID stuff started happening, you know, we had to really think through how we were going to, going to adapt our go-to-market strategies and there was just a ton of stuff that had to get done and and so i think there was like a two or three week period where i was emailing with them almost every day yeah you know, the onus is on you as the founder to ask really good questions you know like what's not helpful is like if i was going to those guys and being like how should i think about sales right now they'd be like huh um i don't know yeah think about it and come back to me instead when i was going to them i was, I was actually thinking through like like Hey, I'm thinking about retooling our pipeline forecasting, you know, based on this, this, and this factor. Like, is there anything that you think that I'm missing? And hey, separately, like, would, you know, do you think I'm crazy for adjusting this, this, and this thing? Right. And like, you know, they could come back and be like, that's spot on, that's stupid, do this thing, that, you know, and it's like, and then next thing you know, you have this, you, you start to get all these reps in. Right. And so the quality of kind of like roll your sleeves up mentors like that means that it might have taken me three or four months to figure all that stuff out on my own. Figured it out in sub 30 days, if at all, right? Sub 30 days. Oftentimes, the quality of that decision is only the shelf life isn't very long anyways, right? Like, it would be of no use to me if I didn't figure this stuff out for three months. But if I figure it out in three weeks, all of a sudden, it's very useful, very impactful. So so stuff like that is, is huge, you know. Um, you know, one of our independent directors on the board, uh, this guy, Tim Harvey, you know, he, he has kind of been like somewhat of kind of like a kind of executive coach a little bit, you know, for me where, you know, like, for example, going into our board meeting last week, I sent him the slides a few days before they go out. I'm like, Hey, you know, I think, I think I got the structure dialed in, you know, what do you think? You know, and he'd come back to me and be like, well, actually I'd like, I think you missed these two things. Everything else looks good. So I don't know. My point in all this is that a lot of the mentorship that I get and, and the feedback that I solicit has a lot more to do with like me really spending the time to think through a problem and a possible solution on my own, whether that's like, how do I structure a board deck in an uncertain time? Or how do I think through evolving our go-to-market strategy over the next 12 months? Thinking through that on my own, coming up with like what I think is the right answer and what my big unanswered questions are. And then going back to somebody who's really an expert in that and saying, so based on all this, what do you think, right? The speed at which you can learn when you're doing that is, is unbelievable. And so I, like, to me, that's far and away the most helpful thing. Um, and, and so if, if you're a founder, the more you can just get people kind of on your roster that you can go to in that capacity, the faster you're going to learn, the quality of your decision making goes up substantially. I totally agree. Like coming up with a perspective and then, you know, reacting on it or, or getting help. I think that's, that's the right approach in that same vein. Since you, since you think through a lot of these things on your own, what's keeping you up at night, right? What are those one to two things that you're focused on right now, other than coronavirus, which is I'm sure all encompassing in all parts of your life. You know, I, I think the, the, the part of our business that's experienced the most change has been, has been go to market. Right. And so like, we've been really lucky in that we've actually seen marketing kind of go through the roof in the month of April without spending more money simply because IT is a lot more top of mind for a lot more companies, either because they're trying to reduce cost or they're trying to figure out how to actually run an IT department in a work from home environment. So like that's gone well, but the landscape still shifted enough where it's like, we just kind of have to rethink everything. Right. And so, in addition to the fact that like we want to grow, we want to grow in a way where our unit economics are getting better. We want to properly take advantage of the tailwinds that are happening. Um, but there, there's just a lot more moving parts than there were. So you know, in terms of what keeps me up at night, it's the fact that we're still trying to grow the business aggressively, take advantage of the new opportunities, uh, and still do it in a way that makes sense, you know, from a cost perspective for the business. You know, I think we tripled the number of moving parts on our kind of go-to-market strategy, you know, overnight. So it keeps me up at night, not in the sense that I worry about it, but more in the sense of like, we just, we have a lot going on and we, and we want to make sure we get it right. You know? And then I think 
you know, the other thing is retention has been a lot better than we thought. But what happens long term? I don't know. Like, I think we're far from out of the woods on a lot of stuff. And so I think, you know, I'm just I'm continuing to just try to work with my executive team to stay close to the data so that, um, you know, as things evolve, we can kind of look at leading indicators and, you know, hopefully make smart decisions and avoid bigger problems down the road. Yeah. So a question for you, unique to you, because you've you started three companies in three, I would assume, kind of different parts of your life, right? One like right out of college or in college, right out of college, one mid to late 20s, one 30s. If you were to teleport back and you could tell yourself a couple, one to two things each time right before or like right at the beginning of those journeys, what would you tell yourself each time? Wow. I think before the first company, I would have taught myself to be more strategic in the sense that I was really good at chopping wood in that first company, you know, my solution to everything was just work more, work more, work more, get more work. Right. You know, and it, it was very much like it sort of lose the forest through the trees kind of scenario where it was like, I would just work, just do more to try to make up for the fact that something wasn't working rather than questioning, like, is this even the right thing at its core? It's, it's sort of the basis of like the work smarter, not harder. But I think everyone says that, but I often, many people don't actually do it. So uh, I think that was probably, probably the biggest thing that would have would have would have helped me because we would have we would have burned the same amount of calories but gotten further because I think we just would have questioned more decisions and and, and then done things differently. Uh, the second company would have been I mean there's a million things <laughs> I would have told myself to do differently but the, the, the second company probably would have been more about like self-preservation. Like I think that um probably 75, 80% more more of of like the like just like the mental anguish and like the psychological sort of terror. It was all self-inflicted. Like no one, no one made us do anything. Like everybody, when, when you, you gotta remember, like when you start a company, most people kind of all start from the same place. Like you all, like you, you know, presumably reasonably intelligent, blank sheet of paper, eyes wide open, market opportunity, right? All first time founders and even second time, like you're all starting from largely the same place. You know, we just made everything way, way too hard. We made everything way harder than it needed to be. You know, we were like, delusional about how long it would take to raise money. We didn't really listen to people's advice. You know, I didn't know anything about hiring. So like I hired a lot of the wrong people. So then I was more stressed. Like when I, when I think back to how stressed I was running swarm and, you know, I think just like kind of how miserable I was all the time, again, it was all my own creation. Right. And it was all totally avoidable. And so, yeah, I think, I think if like, it's okay to, to go through periods where things are not going well and you're kind of down. But if that's just how things are all the time, like you really, really got to reevaluate, right? And, and so I never really did that reevaluation. We just powered through. And it, like, in the end, it worked out really well for us, but like we'd never want to do that again, you know? And, and, and then so as a result, like with Electric, this is far and away the most successful company I've started. And it's involved, I mean, there have been some really hard times. But compared to Swarm, compared to Banquet, way easier. Not way even easier. close. We're not even close. I'm actually happy. Like I enjoy running this company. I don't think I, I don't think I enjoyed my job at my previous two companies for ninety percent of it. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting insight. I feel like you you do hear that from from a good majority of founders. Like, you know, the ones that do enjoy it, even even so, there's some parts that they really hate. But a lot of founders, if you lift up the hood, they're they're uncomfortable and not happy a lot of the time, right? No, no question. Yeah. And again, it's like you're, 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 you're out of your league on so many things all at once, but you're like committed to doing it. And it just, it can be a really, 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 really miserable, lonely existence. But if you get to the, to a point where you're on your second or third company, I was talking to Mike Brown at Bowery Capital. He and I were talking about this uh, a few months ago and I was like, yeah, man, I'm like, I, I actually, I love what I do. I love showing up every day. I'm just like, I actually, I'm, just I'm, I'm into this like i like it a lot and i couldn't say that about my first couple companies and he's like dude i've noticed the same thing he's like all all my second and third time founders like they show up every day because they like it and they kind of know what they're doing and 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 they're doing it because it's, it's they, they only want to be doing that it's the the first time founders where you're just so in over your head all the time it, it'd be really hard to actually have fun yeah so it, kind of a corollary to that in most of these interviews that I've had a lot of the founders are like, God, I love doing this or, you know, I like it most of the time, but it's so hard. How would you answer like, why is being a founder so hard? How would you characterize that? It's the only job on the planet 
where you're expected to not know what you're doing, but expected to produce results consistent with somebody who knows exactly what they're doing, right? Like, it's really weird, right? Like, if you think about it, like, if I, like, if the New York Jets held their training camp and just, like, grabbed a bunch of dudes who raised their hands and said, like, I want to be a quarterback and, like, put them onto the field and then, and then were, like, pissed that they, like, couldn't throw a touchdown in a game, you'd be like, that's crazy. Why, like, <laughs> they have no training. <laughs> they were given no help. I can't believe they failed. Well, I, I guess it's a hard job. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, you look at that and be like, that's crazy, right? As far as I can tell, startups and I think the music industry, the only lines of work where you take people with relatively little professional experience, hand them millions of dollars and basically no help and expect the world. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> and it's interesting too, because like after I closed, either a Series A or Series B, I was talking to um, Steve Schlafman, um, who's a early stage VC and an executive coach in New York. And I was like, yeah, I mean, think about it. Like in the NFL, They'll give a they'll give a player who's fresh out of college, you know, they're going to bet millions of dollars on this player, you know, directly and indirectly between the league minimum salary and all the other resources they put into. But they're going to surround that player with a nutritionist and a trainer and a strength coach, a psychologist, with, with, like like a dozen a dozen people, and then they're going to make sure they're staying out of trouble, and then they're going to do all this other stuff, everything, right? A publicist. And still the expectation is that like one in 10 of those guys will work out after training camp, right? You know, with startups, I don't know, I've raised $60 million and, you know, I have a water bottle with the firm's logo on it. (laughs) And I'm not saying that to diss my, I love my investors and they give me a lot of, they give me a lot of their time and they've made every introduction and I've, and I've built my own network of mentors and I've kind of built like the equivalent of like, you know, an NFL team's, you know, kind of office and training staff for myself. You know what I mean? But like for the average founder, like you got to go do that yourself. Like for the average founder, it's literally like, you know, you go raise your seed round. Here's $2 million and here's a t-shirt with our logo on it. And uh, good luck. let us know how we can be helpful. And it's like, really? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. So the, the next two are, you know, less about business, more about like personal. So I've, I've started to read a lot about morning routines. A lot of successful people have, you know, like, religious morning routines. Do you have one? And what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It started when I was running Swarm. Um, I don't wake up nearly as early as I used to. Lucky now, like I don't have to commute. I live a 10 minute walk from the office. We don't have kids yet. Um, So I think my life's really easy in that respect. Um, But it, it starts with getting a lot of sleep. Like I did not get a good night's sleep for probably most of my 20s. Um, And so now you know, I track my sleep. There's a huge difference between me getting six hours of sleep and me getting, you know, seven and a half or eight hours of sleep. So I go to bed at roughly the same time every night. I wake up at roughly the same time every morning. Again, because I don't have to commute, I don't have to get up that early. So, you know, usually like 6 a.m. on the nose, um, I get up and first thing I do in the morning is exercise and either cardio or weights. Um, if the weather's nice, go ride my bike, whatever but always hard exercise, always, you know, six or seven days a week, you know, on my rest days, I'll, you know, I'll have like two rest days. I'll do like light cardio, um, but exercise every day. I, my stress, you know, hard exercise plus plenty of sleep. My, my stress is way down, mental clarity through the roof. My energy is high. So I start my day that way. I try not to drink a lot of coffee anymore. That too much caffeine keeps me up at night and causes anxiety. I don't drink anymore. I stopped drinking almost two years ago. Um, that's made a huge, huge difference. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically it. I mean, it's not it's not rocket science, right? Like sleep, exercise, be consistent in how you do those things. Don't put total garbage in your body. And like the other thing that I've that I've also done too is I also started noticing that like a lot of my stress came from not being adequately able to focus on my biggest strategic priorities in the morning. I'm I'm lucky now that I have an executive team and I have more flexibility over my schedule. I generally don't schedule meetings or calls before 10:30 or 11 a.m. unless it's an emergency, um, so that I can I can get to my desk, get in front of my computer, and whatever the most important one or two things are that I need to do that day, they're done first thing in the morning when I'm at my peak. Right. That's a great tip. You know, so everything else after that is like whatever. 
it's important, but because otherwise what, what people often do, and I found myself doing this is like, I have that one really important thing. And I just like, I'm like, I'll, I'll do it before lunch. I'll do it after lunch. I'll do it after yeah, my meeting. It just oh, keeps just, getting pushed. I'll just stay late. I'll do it. Well, now it's eight o'clock. I'll just do it tomorrow morning. Like it's done before I even have time to let it kind of chew away at my brain. Yeah. That's a great tip. Um, so a, a similar question, I haven't asked this to anyone, but I think you'd have a good answer to this. If I were to give you 30 seconds to pitch someone on one thing they could start doing to like improve their life, whether it's, you know, I, you already mentioned sleep, but like intermittent fasting, meditation, anything in that realm, what would you say is like a must start doing tomorrow? Look, I, I think the combination of sleep and exercise is like beyond, beyond game changing. So it's not, that's like not the most insightful thing, but sleep exercise. And if you're doing anything to damage your body, whether it's like drinking too much or eating really shitty food, just like stop doing it. It's just, it's been so shocking to me over the last couple of years, how like really, 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 really basic things. If you do them together, they have this force multiplier effect. And if you do them consistently, right? Like, you know, I used to, I used to exercise a lot and I thought I was getting a lot of sleep, but then I'd like go get like really drunk on a Friday night, <laughs> like be like shit till like Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. You know, you undo all that work or, you know, or even just when my sleep was bad or I would sleep a lot, but I wasn't really exercising. And so like, I'd still feel kind of sluggish and tired, you know? So it's just that it, you know, it, there's a reason why in every movie where you have like some like down on his luck guy, who then decides they want to not be that person anymore. Like every movie has some montage where like some dude's like jogging early in the morning. Yeah. Right? <laughs> or like every movie like like that, right? And there's a reason for that is like the second you start actually really dialing your 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 program in and focusing on your health, your luck turns around. Things start to change. I totally agree with that. Okay, so one more question in the final two around learning and resources. So any books you know, newsletters, podcasts, people you follow on social that you would recommend for either aspiring entrepreneurs or just people who like this stuff and want to learn more? Yeah. So high output management. I mean, this is like a really kind of cliche recommendation, um, but it's kind of like the quintessential book on, on like effective management by Andy Grove. He was CEO of Intel for a while, but must read just kind of forms the the backbone of just like modern thinking in business around like goal setting and management and you know, stuff like that. So, uh, and it's a relatively quick read. I would do that. Um, the high growth handbook is also very good. There's just a, there's one chapter on every department of a company. And so I think as a first time founder, that's, that's a really useful, but yeah, I think if you just read those two, if you just read those two and like combine that with just having some smart people to go to consistently with questions, you'll, You'll find that you're learning a lot faster than you would if you spent a gazillion dollars on an MBA. Awesome. Cool. I'll link, I'll link those up, those two books up for sure. All right. Final two questions. I'm pumped to hear your answers for these. So the first one, if you had to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out, what would they be? Well, yeah. So, so first and foremost, like you have to always remember that as a startup CEO, your, your very first job is uh, don't run out of money. It's, uh, it's, it's crazy at every stage, how often people forget that. Like it just, you don't have a business if you don't have money. So everything you do, you always have to first go back to like, am I running out of money or not? So, so, so start there. Um, the, the second one, you know, and this obviously this is more relevant for people who are starting out, but it's also, I find companies lose their way as they get further along. It's like, you just have to build a product that people love like full stop, like there's nothing, you can build a tool that you jam down people's throats or that has a really nifty growth hacky way to get to a lot of usage. But like, at the end of the day, like the best companies, you can only build them if, it, if you start with a product that people love. And you really have to put that, uh, put that before everything. Uh, yeah, the, the, the third thing is I would say, just be smart about who you spend time with. Uh, because there are a lot of people who purport to be doing extraordinary things who are rather unremarkable people with bad advice. And so, um, you know, people always say like, you're, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So think about who those people are for you right now and maybe who they should be. I'm not saying like, don't hang out with your friends, but in a professional context, like 
if you're if you're not sort of like the dumbest person in the room, then you're I think you're you're not surrounding yourself with the kind of people you're gonna learn from. And then I think the last thing is you just don't don't ever make excuses for yourself ever you know about anything, right? Like it's just it's so easy when the job at hand is so hard to rationalize everything. And it's really easy as a startup founder to 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 always think to yourself like, well, my situation's harder. Like, no, it's not. Like certain companies have a little easier than others, right? But like at the end of the day, like you don't have, you, there's a very good shot that there's nothing unique about your situation and it's not really harder. You're just making it harder. And so that's not the advice people usually want, but like. <laughs> it's the advice they need. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. So the second question is a nomination. So it's it's your turn to nominate another founder that could either be a friend, colleague, or mentor of yours that you'd like to see on the show in the future. Yeah, so I think a great person for you to talk to would be one of my closest friends, uh, Josh Bruno. Uh, so he was the founder and CEO of a company called Home Team um, in the healthcare space in New York. Um, they're still around. They've, they've grown quite a bit. Um, he is now the founder and CEO of a company called Path, uh, which is doing something in the addiction space. But he's he's really a pro when it comes to you know, not just building and scaling operationally complex businesses, but but doing them in a highly regulated space. I think Path is going to is going to do incredible things. He's built a phenomenal team. He's out in Los Angeles now, uh, building that. But uh, yeah, he'd be a great guy for you to talk to. Awesome. Thank you so much for for the nomination. Um, so I, I want to acknowledge you for a second. One thing I I picked up from you is your awareness. So I think there were some some stories you shared around, right? You you knew you needed to build an executive team, so you you were aware of that kind of ahead of time. Took a step back, did that, right? You you said you knew you wanted to build the sales process thoroughly, completely from from the ground up. So that when you scaled, you'd have that mechanism in place. So I think what, what impressed me a lot about you is you seem to have incredible awareness, and that's that's led you to some some great decisions. And I'm. I'm pumped to kind of stay connected to electric and, and kind of follow you guys as you, as you grow. So thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, and this was, this was a lot of fun. So one last thing. So if, if anyone hears this and they want to follow you on social or, you know, connect with electric, you want to plug your, your social handles and electrics as well. Yep. So at Dennehy XXL, uh, on all social media platforms, including Twitter. Um, and it's at, electric underscore AI on all social media platforms. Awesome. Ryan Dennehy, founder of Electric AI. Thank you so much. My man, thank you. Thank you for listening to that episode with Ryan Dennehy of Electric. Remember, if you liked what you heard and want to support the show, there's a couple quick things you could do that would really help us out. One, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. If you go on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star rating and a couple-sentence positive review on why the show inspired you. These ratings and reviews are super important, and they signal to Apple that they should put our show in front of other people that might like it. Two, follow us on social, mainly Instagram and Twitter, at Founder Podcast. Each week, we put out teasers, audio clips, and important quotes from the episode. And lastly, check out our website as a mission control for the show. Go to thefounderpod.com to check it out. We have a page on there called Special Offers where we link up discount codes from our founders' companies as well as all the books and resources that have been recommended across all of our episodes. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway and this is The Founder. Founder.